أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله Most gracious, most merciful Master of the day of judgment Thou do we worship, and thy aid we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of, the way of those on whom thou have bestowed thy grace, those whose portion is not wrath, and who go not astray. This was the opening, uh, the opening scripture in the Quran. On behalf of the Muslim Student Association at LSU and uh, the Islamic Center of Baton Rouge, I would like to welcome you to our lecture tonight. The, we feel that, as students here at LSU, that uh, tonight's, tonight's lecture, on <coughs> which will be entitled, in response to Brother Swaggart, Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Bible. This will be the topic of tonight's lecture. We appreciate your presence here, and before we go ahead and start our event tonight, I'd like to briefly describe some things about our speaker tonight. He is a scholar in comparative religion, as well as the director of the Islamic Propagation Center in Durban, um, South Africa. He has been involved in the, with the Muslim community for a long time. He is also the author of several publications among which are Christ in Islam, is the Bible God's word, what the Bible says about Muhammad, peace be upon him, Islam's answer to the racial problem, and our Quran, the ultimate miracle. So please welcome Brother Ahmed Didad for our lecture, our speaker for tonight's lecture. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أرأيتم إن كان من عند الله وكفرتم به وشهد شاهد من بني إسرائيل على مثله فآمن واستكبرتم إن الله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين صدق الله صدق الله الرزيم Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters the subject for this evening is in response to Brother Swagart, in response to Brother Swagart, Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Bible. In response to Brother Swagart last night, at question time, somebody posed a question to him where he was asked whether there was any mention of Muhammad وسلم, in the Christian Bible. And Brother Swagat, according to his understanding, knowledge, he said, Most every religion tries to find the Bible and somewhere in their teachings and their beliefs. And so does the Quran. It tries to say that it is mentioned in the Bible or Muhammad is mentioned in the Bible but uh, Mohammed is not mentioned in the Old Testament. He said, no, there is nothing in the Bible about Muhammad. Now, the format as it was, if you were there last night, was that questions were put to one speaker at a time. One to Didat, one to Swagat. One to Didat, one to Swagat. And they had to respond to those questions. It was not there at question time a debate between Swagat and Didat. Can you see? So I couldn't say, excuse me, you know, he says, look, there is something there and start debating with him on the point. That was not the occasion. 
However, I am now responding to that question, to Brother Swagat's statement that there is nothing in the Bible about Muhammad. Now, if I had the opportunity then, of course, the audience, you know, a greater audience than tonight, but since this is being recorded, I'm sure it will reach Brother Swagat. I have uh, met a brother from his ministry, from his college, and I hope and pray that he will take my message to him. I love and admire Brother Swagat and his wife, Frances. I met this couple before the actual you know, meeting, actual debate, and I enjoyed their company, and they seem to have enjoyed mine. Marvelous people, you know, charming people. And I was telling somebody this morning that if charm can convert, charm, charm. I said, I would be a Christian. I would have been converted. But you see, the charm is there. But I say, the theology is not right. You know, the understanding, concept of God is not right. But charming people. I pay tribute to Brother Swagat and his wife. Now, I have dealt with this topic before. And initially, when I started talking about the subject of what the Bible says about Muhammad, وسلم, I didn't know at the beginning, and for a very long time, I didn't know that the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was mentioned by name in the Bible. Mentioned by name. Learned. Many will say, look, where? Brother Swagat has been through the Bible, as he says, countless number of times. Certain verses, he's mentioning in his books, he's read it countless number of times. I have read the Bible through many, many, many times. And others such as I have read it many more times, much more educated than I could ever be, understanding both Hebrew and Greek. And with this countless number of reading, the man doesn't see it. How can that be? I said, you see, what has happened is this. First, that Muhammad is mentioned by name in the original scriptures. The Old Testament, according to Christian authorities, was preserved in the Hebrew language. And the New Testament in Greek scriptures, Greek language. In the Old Testament, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, in the Hebrew language, it reads, I'm sure Brother Swagat would appreciate it because I thought I heard him say that he knows Hebrew and he knows Greek. In the Hebrew language, it says, Hikko mamittakim vi kullo muhammadim zehdudi vi zehrei bainat Jerusalem. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. The word muhammadim is muhammad im, im, I am im. Im is a plural of respect in Hebrew. You see the first verse of the Bible, book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word God in Hebrew there is Elohim. In Hebrew, El, El stands for God. Ella stands for God. Elohim is a plural form to say with all respect and reverence. Plural of respect. In all Eastern languages, including Arabic and Hebrew. There are two types of plurals. In my own mother tongue, we have plural of respect as well as of numbers. In Urdu, plural of respect as well as numbers. You see, in the Quran also we find the very same thing. Like the verse Allah says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. That it is for us to send down the revelation and it is for us to protect it. Who is this us? Ask any Muslim. Who is this us? Is Allah, Jibreel and Muhammad like Father, Son and Holy Ghost? No, no. But is us, who is us? When we are told in the Holy Quran, Qul, Allahu Ahad, say, He is Allah, the one and only. 
Here he's talking about us. No Arab Christian has ever asked the Muslim, I said the Arab Christian, has ever asked the Muslim, who is this us? Because he knows in his language, there are two types of plurals. Plural of numbers and plural of respect. This as is like in royal proclamations, you have plural of respect. We have decreed, says the queen. We. Who is this we? Not she and her husband and her, her son. No, no, no. It's standing for herself. Out of respect. Plural. So Elohim is a plural of respect. Im. El is God. Elah is God. Elohim is more than one of respect. But our Christian brethren, you see, when they want to prove the Holy Trinity, that God Almighty is to be found in three persons, three personalities in a trinity. So they say this as stands for Father, Son and Holy Ghost because it is in the plural. So admittedly it is in the plural. But if it stands for gods, that's a correct translation. But there is not a Bible on earth with the dozens of different versions. There's not a single Bible on earth where it says, in the beginning, gods created the heavens and the earth. I said, why are you so dishonest? If it is plural, why don't you put plural? You say, in the beginning, gods created the heavens and the earth. Why do you say God? You say, if it's plural, say so. That they were gods, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and these three put together, they created the heavens and the earth. No. Ask any Jew. This is his book. Ask him, what is his im? He said, look, in my language, this is the plural of respect. God is one, but out of respect we speak like that. Im. It says, Muhammad im. Muhammad im. Plural of respect. The word is there in the Hebrew language. In the original, what they call original, it's there. But they have translated that in English as altogether lovely. So this beloved of mine is altogether lovely, says Solomon. When you read altogether lovely, you can't associate with the word Muhammad. You read it a thousand times, altogether lovely, altogether lovely. Or let's say in another language, the praised one, the praised one. Muhammad means the praised one. But he said the praised one, the praised one. You can't think that he's talking about Muhammad. Though Muhammad means the praised one. You have no right to translate names of people. Anybody. Your name should be retained. Mr. Black is Mr. Black. Though he's white. He's a European, a Caucasian. But you can't say Mr. Uh, Mr. Abu uh, Aswad. You can't say in Arabic, this is Mr. Aswad. He is Mr. Black. When I say in Urdu, I say, he is Mr. Black hair. I can't say he is Mr. Kala. You know? It's ridiculous. I have no right to translate names of people. You know, at one time, the president of South Africa was Munir Swat. Munir in Afrikaans means Mr. Swat means Black. Munir Swat means Mr. Black. But I have to retain the word Swat to tell you that he's an Afrikaner. If I translated it as Mr. Black, you might think he's an Englishman. If I translated that Mr. Kala, you think he's a Pakistani. Can you see? If I translated it as Zulu, Nimzan, Myama, it means black. You'll think he's a Zulu, the president of South Africa. You have no right to translate names of people. But they have been doing that. Muhammad Im, they translated as altogether lovely. But the word Muhammad is there in the Hebrew language in the original. Now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we say, when we analyze, but to give you further proof, that this sickness has been very common among the translators of the Bible, more especially in Christendom, you see, they have been translating names like, for example, Messiah. Messiah. Jesus was the Messiah. Hebrew word, Messiah. In Arabic, Masih. Translated, Christ. How does that come about? How do we call him Christ? 
I said, you see, the Hebrew word Messiah or Messiah means to anoint, to rub over. You know, when we Muslims, when we go for Salat, prayer, we make wudu, ablution. And in the part of our ablution, besides washing the hands, brushing the teeth, washing the face, washing the feet, the arms up to the elbows, we wet our hands and we rub them over this way. Every Muslim does that. If he's particularly with his prayers, five times a day he does that. Every time he makes wudu, he, after washing everything, he wets his hands and he rubs them over. Like this, like that, and like that. What do you call that? Masa. See, we say masa. Masa comes from the Hebrew word. Same word, masa. Masa, masaha in Arabic and Hebrew means to rub, to massage, to anoint. And the person who is so done, we call him Messiah, Masih, on whom this was done. Priests and kings were anointed, means rubbed over with holy oil or holy water. Say, so from today you are our priest, our imam, or from today you become our ruler. See, we say like the coronation ceremony, you have the gowning ceremony, now you have the anointing ceremony. That's what it means, anointed. So, Messiah, in Greek, translated into Greek, is Christos. Christos means anointed. And they take off the os. Christos is a bit lengthy, so you get left with Christ. Christ means the anointed one, the one who is anointed. Priests and kings were anointed. So this is the title of Jesus, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. Jesus again was not his name. His name was classical Yeshua. Esau, Isa. Okay? That was his name. In the Hebrew language, when he was born, his mother didn't give him the name Jesus because there's no such word as Jesus in Hebrew. J, the J is not there. It's Esus, Esau, Isa. Yeshua. Classical Yeshua. But they have a, a habit. The Western, he has a sickness for adding J's where there are no J's. They have what is called a J sickness. So Yusuf, there's a Joseph. Yaqub, there's a Jacob. See? <laughs> Johanna, there's a John. Where there is no J, they put a J. Latinizing the le le words, as if it sounds like Western. This is a sickness. All subject people have, but more particularly, the Christians had it. They add J's. It says, Yahuwah. So the Jehovah's Witness was Jehovah. They put a J with there's no J. Wherever. This is, I say, in, in religion, they do jaywalking. In my country, you can be charged for jaywalking. Jaywalking means, you know, you cross the street, you know, where there's not pedestrian crossing. There's supposed to be certain pedestrian crossing in our main roads. And if you cross anywhere else, the police on the other side, he can catch you and he can give you a ticket for what is called jaywalking. The Christians have jaywalked into people's names. Anywhere, everywhere. <laughs> so now, Jesus Christ, in his second coming, we believe that he's coming again. What for? We are told in the Gospel of St. Matthew why he's going to come again. He says, on that day, Many will say to me on that day, when he is coming, second coming, say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty works? Didn't we do all these things in your name? We built hospitals, co colleges, universities, we looked after the poor. Didn't we do all these things in your name? And we cast out devils, we healed the sick, and the blind, and the lepers. Didn't we do it in your name? Jesus says, then will I profess unto them, these guys, these people who say, we did all these things in your name. Lord, Lord, we did it in your name. Jesus says, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Get away out of my sight. For sack, get away, you rubbish. I don't even know you. I'm asking the Christians. He said, look, why should he tell you foot sack? That's a, our local term. That means get away. Why would he tell you, get out of my sight? When you did all these things in his name. He's not going to tell the Hindus, get
get away foot sack. He's not going to tell the Muslims, get away foot sack. He's not going to tell uh, the Jews, get away foot sack. But he's going to tell you, the Christian, those who say, Lord, Lord. I say, I want to know why. Why would he tell you foot sack? Answer that. And no answer forthcoming. Why would he tell you? Not the Jews, not the Hindus, not the Muslims, but you, his followers, and who have done this miracles, we have worked miracles, and he's going to tell you, get out. So I said, he's coming to do a certain job of work. But in his second coming, let's say we recognize him, that this is Jesus in his second coming. And you shout, you cry out, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. I said, he won't even turn and look at you. Because he never heard the word Jesus, and he never heard the word Christ in his life. Because these are new words you have concocted. He says, he saw Yeshua, you say Jesus, he doesn't know. He says, I don't know who you're shouting for. <laughs> so they translated the word Messiah into Christ. Christ he never heard. Peter, Peter, his leading disciple. You see, before he parted, he says, Peter, feed my, feed my flock, feed my lamb, feed my sheep. Meaning, look after the others. You are, you know, the elder most. You are the most mature, the best qualified to look after the others. Peter, his name was Simon. Simon Peter. Heard the name? Peter. Common name among the Christians. I said, you know, Peter never heard the word Peter in his life. You didn't know that? You see, his name was Simon. And Jesus at one stage, you know, because of his stubbornness, he was a very stubborn you know, and militant like the Irish man. The Irish man. They're fighting people, spirited people. So he was one of that type among his disciples, the most militant. So Jesus describes that quality as a Simon, thou art Kephas. And on this rock I'll build my church, thou art Kephas. Kephas in Hebrew means a rock. You are like a rock. Thou art Kephas. Kephas means rock or stone. So the Christians translated that into Petros. Petros in Greek means rock or stone, from which you get the word Peter. Peter never heard the word Peter in his life. Believe me, you've got to. I want people to come forward and say, no, I'm wrong. I want people to come and correct me. Learned men, come and talk to me. I said, Peter never heard the word Peter in his life. He was Simon Kephas. You translated Kephas into Petros, Kephas means rock or stone, Petros means rock or stone, from which you now derive the word Peter. See what's happening? This is a type of sickness all subject people have. To try and match you, the sound of your name, to match that of the ruling race. Inferiority complex, as we all suffer from. My own people in South Africa, we suffer from the sickness as well. I don't know about you here, you are expatriates, you are all new here. But I don't know when a settled community, that settled community, how they behave as they get along. We have Yusuf, we'll call them Joe. We call them Joe. We have Fatima, we call them Tima. You know, sounds like, like the Western, Tima. If he says Fatima, you know, is the daughter of Muhammad. Khadija, we say Dija. Ibrahim is Abraham, Abraham. No, this is, is a, a, an inferiority complex we all suffer from. And the Christians were not exempt from that sickness. And that created problems. You translated names of people. Saul translated to Paul. You see, some Saul, if you're a child, you name him, as a Christian, you name him Saul, people think you're a Jew. But if you change that Paul, Saul to Paul, Paul sounds Greek or Roman. See? Yeshua sounds Jewish, 100%. But Jesus, you denationalize him. He's denationalized. Christ, he's denationalized. Messiah is still Jewish. Messiah is still Arabic. This is. So we said, look, you have lost the name Jesus Christ, according to the Holy Quran says, Wa is qala Isa ibn Maryam. Says, Behold, Jesus, the son of Mary, said, 
يا بني إسرائيل أو تقولون في إسرائيل إني رسول الله إليكم. So most certainly I am the messenger of God sent to you all. مصدق لما بين يدي من التوراة. Confirming the revelation which came before me. ومصدق مصدق لما بين يدي من التوراة. ومبشرا برسول يأتي من بعد اسمه أحمد. And giving you glad tidings of a messenger to come after me whose name shall be Ahmad which is another name for Muhammad Muhammad and Ahmad are synonymous terms for this mighty messenger of God Ahmad that is what the Quran tells us but the Christian says look it's not in my book it's not here there's no Ahmad and there's no Muhammad so you are left with no alternative but to analyze what is there. You see, they have a verses in the Bible, in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, where it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus says. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him. And when he's come, he will convict the world in respect of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not in me and on and on. He says, if I don't go, the comforter will not come unto you. We say that comforter is Muhammad. They says, no. Jesus didn't say Muhammad. He said comforter. We are asking, did Jesus speak English? Did he say comforter? He says, no. He spoke Hebrew. That's his mother tongue. Then he said, what did he say? You haven't got it. In other languages, in the Arabic language, nearest to Hebrew, the same verse reads, لَكِنِّي أَكُولُ لَكُمُ الْحَقُّ إِنَّهُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ أَنْتَلِكَ لِأَلَّهُ إِلَّمْ أَنْتَلِكَ لَا يَعْتِيكُمُ الْمُعَزِّ وَلَكِنْ إِنْ زَهَبْتُ أُرْسِلْهُ إِلَيْكُمْ He used the word مُعَزِّ. I said, did you speak Arabic? He says, no. I said, what did he say? In Afrikaans, the word there is truasta. I said, did you speak Afrikaans? He says, no. Then what did he say? In Zulu, he says, um, togazi, I said, did you speak Zulu? You're Jesus? He says, no. I said, what did he say? In 2,000 different languages, you can buy the Bible today. 2,000. And in 2,000 different languages, there are 2,000 different names. What did he say? Did he say, muazzi? Did he say, comforter? Did he say, truasta? Did he say, um, togazi, What did he say? The Quran says, he said, Ahmad, which is another name for Muhammad. But since you have lost the term, the name is lost. No sense in me pushing it down the throat. He said, look, it was Ahmad, another name for Muhammad. No. Now what we have to do is to reason. We have to deduce. Reason with them. Our Christian brothers and sisters, reason with them. He said, look, you say it is the comforter. Who is the comforter? Is the, the comforter is the Holy Ghost. They say the comforter is the Holy Ghost. So they'll ask you, is Muhammad a ghost? He says, no. So it can't be Muhammad. I said, now what is that Greek word for ghost in your language? Greek word. It's pneuma. Pneuma means spirit. Wherever it suits you, you translate that word, P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma. A spirit, when it suits you, you translate it as ghost. When you talk about spirit, you can have it fitting Muhammad. But when you say ghost, like a spook, it's very difficult to say Muhammad is a spook. Muhammad was no spook. You know, he was the most solid character in history. This is the difficulty. I will explain what they have done to that word. But they say holy ghost. Muhammad is not the holy ghost. Mm -hmm. But there is no such word as ghost in Greek. So Jesus makes it a condition that if I don't go, he won't come. But if I go, I will send him. So if it is the Holy Ghost, we are suggesting that, look, the Holy Ghost was long before Jesus was with the people. According to your Bible, in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, we are told that Elizabeth had the Holy Ghost. What it means, I don't know. But she had it before Jesus was born. 
the Holy Ghost was there. It tells us again that Zechariah had the Holy Ghost. What that means, I don't know. It also says that John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam, they call him John. Yahya, we say Yahya. Yahya alayhi salam. He had the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb before he was born. The Holy Ghost was with him in his mother's womb inside. What he was doing inside there, I don't know. But it was there. Look, look, this is what the Bible says. Jesus, when he was preaching and healing, he said, I, by the Spirit of God, do these, these things. I, by the finger of God, cast out devils. Spirit of God is that Holy Ghost. Did the Holy Ghost help him in his ministry? He said, yes. Help him to do, perform miracles? He said, yes. Did the Holy Ghost help his disciples? He said, yes. When they went out on the mission of preaching and healing, with whose help were they preaching and healing, if not with the help of the Holy Ghost? So the Holy Ghost was with Elizabeth, was with Zechariah, with John the Baptist from his mother's womb, was with Jesus, was with the disciples. So it makes no sense to say that if I don't go, he won't come. Condition. But if I go, I will send him. Is something other than the Holy Ghost. And it is simple, basic. Now, how can Muhammad, we can say that this Muhammad. Let's see. The same chapter, verse 7, it says, it says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them. Now, nah, you haven't got that capacity. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Spirit of truth. Who is the spirit of truth? Ask the Christian. Is the Holy Ghost. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things so shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. So who is the spirit of truth? They said the Holy Ghost. I said, all right. If this is the Holy Ghost, tell us now. What new things has he given you in the past 2,000 years? He said, Jesus said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. But before we expound this aspect, let me reread to you this verse with a little emphasis on the pronouns. He says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he... The spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. But what things shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. Eight masculine pronouns in one verse. I say, it ill befits a ghost. You agree? That is a man, a man, a man, a man. Eight times. There is not another verse in the whole Bible with eight masculine pronouns or eight feminine gender or eight neuter genders. There isn't. This is a unique verse for a unique personality, Muhammad. Man, man, man. Not a ghost, not a spook. But we are told he's a spirit. Is Muhammad a spirit? I say yes. That's what your Bible says. You see, every time the word spirit is used in your Bible, I'm telling the Christian, it doesn't stand for the Holy Ghost. Because in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it, we are told that seven spirits of God went out into the world. I say, you believe in seven Holy Ghosts? He says, no, there's only one Holy Ghost. I said, look, it's a seven spirits. It means there should be seven Holy Ghosts. No, spirit doesn't stand for Holy Ghost every time. Then in the same John, the same John, in the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 4, he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So false spirit is a false, false prophet is a false spirit. True prophet is a true spirit. The same John is using spirit for a prophet. Don't believe every spirit. Don't believe in every prophet. The spirit, it says, that confesseth that Jesus is the Christ, is of God. It means the prophet that says that Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah, the Messiah, is from Allah. That's what John says. I said, well, find out whether this spirit, this prophet, Muhammad, does say that Jesus is the Christ. Open Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 45, it says, 
behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah yubashiruki bi kalimatin minhu, that Allah gives you glad tidings of a word from him. Ismuhul Masih, his name will be the Messiah, translated Christ. Muhammad said, is he the Christ? Yes, that's what every Muslim believes. On the testification of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, 1,000 million Muslims of the world, they believe that Jesus is the Christ. He says, the spirit that confesses, the prophet that says that Jesus is the Christ is of God. Why don't you apply this to Muhammad? And says, St. John, in the Gospel of St. John, he says, he says, he that is born of spirit is spirit, and he that is born of the flesh is flesh. He said, do spirits beget? Do they prohibit? He says, no. Then how can you be born of spirit? No. In, what it means there is that who is spiritually inclined is spiritual, who is materialistically inclined is flesh. What brought you here tonight? Some kind of gift that you were expecting from Didat? You know, he's going to give you some sweet meat? What? Some chocolates? Is that what brought you here? If that was the case, and suppose I give it out to you, you are materialistically inclined. Material things brought you here. So you are a materialist. In the language of the Bible, you are fleshy, you are of the flesh. Materialist. If it was spiritual consideration, motivation that brought you here, then you are spiritual, you are a spirit, though you are not a spirit. You are solid flesh and bones. But you are spiritually inclined. You are spiritual. This, the gospel language says he that is born means the thing that motivates you, that brings you up into being. If it is spirit, spiritually, then you are a spirit. And if you are fleshly, you are flesh. Material, you are flesh. It doesn't mean a Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit every time the word spirit is used. So Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So this spirit, this Holy Ghost, if it's a Holy Ghost, every church and denomination claims it. Everybody seems to be in touch. You know, at your beck and call, you press the button and it's there. You ask the Jehovah's Witnesses. He says, yes, we have it. Ask the Roman Catholics. They got it. Ask Brother Jimmy Swaggart. He says, he's got it. Everybody has it. All those cults that he mentions in his books, among these 30 books, there's one on cults. You read them. He says, look, the, every cultist says he's got the spirit. Who? The Holy Ghost. Everybody's got it. And they're all going in different directions. So one spirit taking you all into opposite directions from God. No. As Brother Swaggart said yesterday, either we are both right or we, are, we can both be wrong. You both can be right. So you have a thousand sects and denomination among the whites of South Africa, among the whites. And 3,000 among the blacks. In America, I was given to understand that you've got 40 different Baptist churches. Each and every one has got the Holy Ghost, the Spirit. And they're all going in different directions. Is it from God? Can it be from God? All going in different directions. All say they are Baptists and everyone has got the Holy Ghost. So I said, you see, this, you haven't got the solution to the problems. Answers. Jesus, I have yet many things to say unto you. Many. Many in English is more than one. At least you understand that English. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. All is also more than one. I am asking my Christian brethren for the past 40 years. I don't want many solutions. Give me one. That the Holy Ghost gave you in 2,000 years. One. Something that Jesus Christ had not already told you in so many different words. One. Any church, any denomination, any cult, bring me one new thing that the Holy Ghost gave you. And it's not forthcoming. One! I don't want many. Jesus says, ye cannot bear them now. The reason why he didn't give is not because he didn't have it. He had the solution to the problems of mankind. Till doomsday, God gave it to him. But the people were not fit to receive them. That's what he's saying. He's pleading with us. Ye cannot bear them now means you haven't got that capacity. And the truth of that statement is writ large in the Bible. Again and again, Jesus Christ, he tells his disciples, ye of little faith, you got no iman. You have no faith. Little faith, if whatever you have is little, tiny. 
ye of little faith, ye of little faith. How many times? Again and again. And he explains to them spiritual truths as he is explaining to little children and they can't understand what he's talking about. So he says, I even yet without understanding, yet. And when he's provoked further, he says, O faithless and perverse generation, this is what he's calling his disciples. Not the Jews, the generality of Jews, he calls them, you generation of wipers, you whited sepulchres, you wicked and adulterous generation, and on and on. But no, now he's describing his disciples, his own disciples, his chosen ones. He said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? I said, if Jesus was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed that honorable harakiri, suicide. But as a Jew, he couldn't afford to do that. You know, he loved life dearly. He loved life dearly. So he says, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. I said, that spirit of truth is Muhammad. Muhammad is the prophet. We say, As-Sadiqul Wadul. I mean, the prophet who is faithful, truthful. Prophet, As-Sadiqul Wadul. I mean, the truthful, the faithful. He is the prophet of truth. Spirit of truth is the prophet of truth. Muhammad. And he guided mankind into all truth. All your problems. Bring them, bring them, bring them. Brother Swagart, you know, oh, he writes beautiful books. Homosexuality, Sodom and Gomorrah, pornography, alcohol. Beautiful works. I recommend them to you, these books. Not all, but these books especially. I recommend them to you. Read them. Very good. But there are no solutions. You see, alcohol. I dealt with it last night, I think, by the way. He says in this book, alcohol. He says 11 million drunkards in America. 11 million drunkards, he says. These are his terms. In my country, they don't call them drunkards. Especially the whites, you can't call them drunkards. They'll punch you on the jaw. You have to call them alcoholics. You know, they're sick people. See, when you say drunkard, it's very, very pungent, strong. Can you say drunkard? But when you say he's an alcoholic, the man is, person is sick. You know? So he needs some treatment. <laughs> 11 million. These are words of Brother Swagat. Drunkards in America. And 44 million heavy drinkers. And he says, to me, no difference between the two. To me, they are the same. Whether you call them drunkards or you call them heavy drinkers, to me they are the same. I say, MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Praise be to God. We have such a brother who speaks like a Muslim. The only thing is, I said, look, go a one step further. To solve your problem, you have to go a step further. I said, include your social drinkers as well in that list of yours. Because the Holy Prophet Muhammad made no distinction between these three groups that you are thinking of. You know, you've got the drunkards, you've got the heavy drinkers, and you've got social drinkers. Mm -hmm. The Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity. No excuse for a nip or a tot. Finish. Out. He said, strong words. He said, cursed is he who grows grapes for brewing. Growing of fruit trees in Islam is an act of virtue, blessing. Allah will reward you. Whether you plant fruit trees for selling the fruit or for eating it, Allah will bless you, he'll reward you. He said, on one occasion, he said, you see, if you get sure knowledge that tomorrow, 12 o'clock at noon, the earth will be doomed, finished. It's coming to an end. Yawm al qiyamah will set in, 12 o'clock tomorrow. And you are supposed to plant a fruit tree today. So what must you do? It will take seven years for it to bear fruit. Seven years. He says, plant the tree. Allah will reward you. That mighty messenger of God, he said that if you plant grapes for the purpose of brewing, not for eating or selling, but for the purpose of brewing, like my place in the Cape in South Africa, we have what is called the Mediterranean climate, and grapes grow beautifully there. That's the best wine-growing country in that area. And you inherit 100 hectares of land, 200 acres of land. So what am I going to do? I said, plant grapes, the vine. 
But he said, who's going to buy it? I said, don't worry. There's a winery there. There's a brewery there. Unlimited amount they are prepared to buy from you. I said, right. And if you did that, the Prophet of Islam says, cursed is he who grows grapes for brewing. Cursed is he who crushes it. Cursed is he who bottles it. Cursed is he who sells it. And cursed is he who drinks it. Out. No, you have nothing, no truck with that stuff. This is Islam. And your solution to the problem is this, total abstinence, said the Prophet of Islam. On instruction from Allah, revelation of God in the Holy Quran. So, ya amanu, so you believe. Innam al khamru, most certainly intoxicants, wal maisiru, and gambling in his book. One of the books is the American public is spending $54 billion a year on gambling. Squandering. $54 billion. And gambling. Wal ansabu, and fortune telling. Wal aslamu, and idol worship. Rizm in amal shaitan, are an abomination of Satan's handy work. Fajtani buhu la'allakum tuflihun. It's a shun such abomination that you may prosper. And wine barrels were emptied in the streets of Medina, never to be refilled. This, this one verse has created the biggest society of teetotals in the world. People who don't imbibe alcohol. Biggest society in the world. One word, one expression. Brother Swaggart is talking about, he says, you, you got to threaten the Muslims, chop off, chopping off his head, or chopping off his hands. Therefore, if they don't drink. The person does not drink because he fears his hand will be cut off, Amen. or his toes, or his nose, or whatever. Is that the reason? I want to know you in America, the Muslims. I know we have black sheep amongst us, like any community has. We all have. You can't say we are all angels. But how many, what percent of, percentage of Muslims take and buy alcohol? In India, Pakistan, South Africa, my community, I'm boasting in my country. Perhaps it applies everywhere where the Muslims live. I said, we Muslims have the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. We have the lowest gambling rate in the country. We have the lowest prison rate in the country. We have the lowest divorce rate in the country. We have the lowest suicide rate in the country. And we have the highest charity rate in the country. That's what Islam has done for us. La Allahum. Wallah, it's Islam. Nobody has threatened me all my life that I shouldn't smoke. My father used to smoke cigarettes. I don't touch it. My children don't smoke it. I didn't tell them one day in my life, my one of the son is, son is here with me, the other elder son is in South. I never told them one day, don't smoke. I never told them. No, no, uh, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. The, out of my six brothers, one or two, they do smoke. They do smoke. But my family, no smoking. In my life, I have not touch, haven't touched that stuff. Nobody threatened me. My father didn't tell me I mustn't smoke. I don't smoke. I don't gamble. I don't date, I don't court, I don't dance. Nobody threatened me, said, look, if you do that, you go to jail. But if you do that, we'll chop off your head. Nobody told me that. I don't know if anybody told you that you mustn't drink, otherwise we'll chop off your head. Anybody tells you here that? Anybody controlling you? No. What does it? I said, you see, in America, you, Christian nation, mighty nation, the mightiest nation on earth, America, you introduced prohibition in the 20s. Who did it? They were your leaders, people you voted into power. In your Congress or Parliament, in your Congress, they passed law, prohibition, run the country dry. You saw the carnage, that the havoc that this stuff was creating in the nation, the harm, the losses. So the brain power of the nation, people you voted into power, they voted on your behalf, passed a law trying to run the country dry. No Arab government ever threatened them. No Muslims ever threatened them. They said, look, if you don't stop drinking, we won't supply you oil. Because there was no oil. They didn't have it. The Arabs, they had no oil to threaten them with. They said, look, if you don't stop drinking, no oil for you anymore. No. It was your nation, your brain power, and you passed the law. And you failed. You failed miserably. The mightiest nation on earth, with the backing of the government, the brain of the nation, your propaganda machinery, everything put to, and your police force put together to try to implement prohibition and you failed. This mighty messenger of God in a desert country among a barbaric people, he makes the pronouncement and wine barrels were emptied never to be referred. Miracle!
miracles. What miracles are you talking about? Here is a miracle. With all your miracles, you can do nothing. Your problems will increase. You have your handful. These are handful. You know, you say, born again. You know, he says, now we got the spirit in us. And we don't touch it anymore. He says, great. I take off my hat to you. Great. And everyone who testifies, everyone without exception, will tell you that I was a drunkard. I used to speak mari I smoke marijuana. We call it daha, ganja. I used to take drugs. I used to do this. I was promiscuous. I was, a, I was gay. I was a sodomite. But now, I'm a, I don't do those things anymore. I say, congratulations to you. Congratulations. But I said, you see, something took you out of the mire, out of the dirt, out of the filth. Congratulations to you. But I said, but the system that stops you from falling into the mire is a better system any day. Prevention is always better than cure. And you are not able to cure those 45, 55 million drunkards with all your Holy Ghost and all your lecturing and moving people you know, to queue up by the thousands, you will not be able to solve the problem. The answer is total abstinence. And the only religion on the face of the earth which says don't touch that stuff is Islam. <laughs> Brother Swagat has written many books. But there is one book is not forthcoming on surplus women. Look, here is a stupendous problem in America. Stupendous problem. On mere figures alone, statistics tell you, I don't know, I didn't come and count your men and women here. You tell me that there are 7.8 million more women than men. If every man in America got married, there will still be 7.8 million women who can't get husbands. Yeah, problem. Why don't you touch it? They are hungry in New York, just next door to you, New York. They say there are one million more women than men. If every man in New York got married, there will still be a million women in the city alone who can't get husbands. What's the answer? What did the Holy Ghost tell you? I want you to tell them what the Holy Ghost says. Subli sublimate your passions. Is that what you do? Don't you need a wife? And you got a beautiful wife? He said, look, he said, yesterday jokingly, he said, he said, I told him, jokingly, I said, look, you know, Islam allows me up to four. I said, up to four. Though I have only one, but Islam allows me up to four. So he said, you see, I am allowed. Christianity, he said, allows me only one. And, you know, I have chosen the best. I take off my hat. Congratulations. He was teasing my wife and I just before we came on and said, Islam allows four wives. <laughs> he just corrected me, said, up to four. I said, well, <clears throat> Mr. D. Dot, Christianity only allows us one, so I had to get the best on the first shot. <clears throat> But you have solved one woman's problem. There are 7.8 million. Not only 7.8 if every man got married, but your, your, your gay population of New York. One third are gays, sodomites. One third out of the... If it was every man could get married, there would still be one million women in New York alone. But one third of your New York population is gay, sodomites, omelut. You see, your culture, your civilization has created beautiful words, prostituted beautiful words for filthy, dirty things. These sodomites, catamites and sodomites, you call them gay. The first time when I started you know, reading this in the newspapers, gay, I was getting confused. What is gay? <laughs> By God, look, I'm not pretending acting. I'm not a very learned man like most of you, you see. I passed through that elementary stage of education. I've been talking, talking, so I talked myself into this position of talking. That's all. Academic, academically, oh, m most of you, you know, you're far beyond me. But I knew this word gay from childhood, from school. They taught me a poetry at school. My teachers, poetry. It says, gentle lords and ladies, gay, on the mountain dawns the day. And I was rhyming that. 
gay. We used to call people, he's happy and gay. He's happy and gay. No, no, so that is, I mean, this is a very jovial person, whether men or women. She's happy and gay. Man is happy and gay. I thought, nothing, but now they're talking about gay. So what is gay? You know, it seems something suspicious about the way things they're writing about gay. Gay. Now I know that for sodomites, you use such a beautiful word, throwing it away. Now, if I told our chairman is happy and gay. <laughs> He might want to punch me on the jaw. So what do you, what do you take me for? Where did you get that? I said, no. When I used to go to school, you know, it was beautiful. Oh, God, I said, look, no more. Then God Almighty punishes them with AIDS. What a beautiful word, AIDS, for acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Nice. Then they reduce it to AIDS. Filthy, dirty disease. God Almighty is, you know, punishing you for it, but no. You see, you haven't got the answers. Islam gives you the answer to your problem. It says, marry women of your choice by twos and threes and fours, but if you cannot do justice between them, marry only one. And there is a type of man who doesn't mind taking on extra responsibility. And there is a type of woman who doesn't mind sharing a husband. But your law won't allow that. They don't mind. You'll be getting a dozen illegitimate children every year. That they don't mind. You are a stud. Then you are a stud. They call you a stud. But if you lawfully said, look, I'll look after both these women and the children offspring. I'm prepared to be responsible. I said, no, you go to jail. You can plant your wild oats as you like. But don't marry. Sodomy, legalized. Lesbianism, legalized. But when it comes to lawful marriage, natural. Polygamy is natural, you say, oh, my dead body, go to jail. And I said, this is an answer to your problem. You won't listen, then you simmer in your soup. You see, soon after the war, the Second World War, I read a news item in my local paper, Dateline from London. Say we are in close contact with Britain, because we are English-speaking people. It was, South Africa was a colony of Britain. So we are in close contact, almost so many news we get from there, Dateline from Germany or from there, but mostly from London. And I'm reading a small headline, very small. It said, 5,000 misfits to be shipped to America. And you know the human mind is so imaginative. But when I'm reading that, it conjures up a mental picture that these misfits must be cripples or people with hair lip and club foot that, you know, the British people, they, haven't, they are not so advanced in my mind as, as, uh, as the, uh, the American in, in the field of medicine, so they must be sending them for treatment. You know, your hair lips and your club foot, sending them for treatment. That's the immediate picture of 5,000 misfits to be shipped to America. But when I read further, it says that these 5,000 misfits were the offsprings at that time, they said of Negro soldiers stationed in England during the war. They said Negro soldiers. I mean no insult to my Afro-American brothers or my black brothers, but that was written then. 5,000, these are the offsprings of Negro soldiers stationed in England during the war. So I'm asking the question, this was on the west coast of England. I said, how many black soldiers were there compared to the white Australian, the white New Zealander, the white South African, the white Canadian, the white American, the white Free French, the white... Poles and your own British soldiers, compared to all that, how many blacks were there? Negligible. Then soldiers, before they go, they're training, they're told to use prophylactics, you know, birth control, you must not avoid getting infected with VD, with gonorrhea, right. And then we also know that every arrow doesn't hit the mark, nor is every prayer granted. What amount of mischief was done in Christian England to produce those 5,000 misfits during the period of the war? What amount? Can you imagine? They have a, these children of our Negro brethren were too dark to be absorbed into English society. You see, if you had your sister bringing such a brat in the house and the child, girl or boy, is growing with a crinkly hair and with a little stump nose and, you know, a little high cheekbone, this is everybody coming along and saying, who's this? 
He said, my sister Mary's child. Who's this? He said, my sister Mary's child. How do you feel? Your sister Mary's child. So, how does it come about? You know, we are white. See, Caucasian, you see, your, your, father, your mother is white, your father is white, everybody is white, and where did you get this? So, so, well, you know, some Negro fellow, my sister must have gone out with him, you know, and produced this. Ooh, stinking. So he said, look, let us send them to America to be absorbed into Negro society. So they shipped them to America. We don't know, I don't want to take names. You know, many of our, some of our leading men in America might be one of those 5,000. We don't know. But can you see? The answer, I said, you have a surplus, four million more women in England than men. Four million more women than men on the East Coast alone. He says 1.6 million more women than men on the East Coast of England. What do you do with them? Pickle them, send them to Tibet. They're running short of women. Send them there, what? I says, no, there is a type of man who does not mind taking on extra responsibility. I saw it on your program here. I was in Canada and from across the border, from Buffalo or somewhere, there was a program being beamed in all directions, also to Canada in the hotel, I switched it on, and I see a program about polygamy. And there was a man there, he said, I got eight wives. He was an ex-Mormon. He was um, excommunicated. The Mormons at one time, they allowed polygamy, unlimited polygamy. Joseph Smith and Brigham Young had many wives. So now, because of the force, pressures from the other groups, he said, <laughs> you Mormon, how many wives have you got? <laughs> you Mormon, how many? so they threw away. No more. But this Mormon, and he was telling, he gave a figure, a startling figure, about now. He said, 20,000 Mormons have been excommunicated for having more than one wife. They have them. They can't register them, but they have more than one wife. 20,000 Mormons. This man, he said, I have eight wives. And they're all happy with me. And none of them were married before. None of them. They were not virgins, but they were none married before. Then in the, from the audience, live audience, you see, one nice, plumpy, middle-aged woman, she stands up and says, look, what about me? He says, you too, give me your address, I'll recontact you. <laughs> you see, you ask those women who have got no husbands. There will be about 20 million who are in the marriage market, 20 million in the marriage market, at least, who are hungry for husbands. And they're hunting for men in New York. I'm reading, they're hunting for men. And the men are becoming shy and becoming gays. <laughs> you know, before coming here, I started, I left home, I think on the 16th of uh, November, no, October, October, Pakistan, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Sharjah, Al Ain, and here. And I have been telling my people there, I said, you people, don't be fools, man. Running to Bombay, running to Beirut, running to London. What for? I said, go to New York. Try and help them to solve the problem. <laughs> Bring. I said, four, four at a time. You know, you must bring four, four at a time. Your country is sparsely populated. And there's no population, vast stretch of lands and no people. Saudi Arabia, with that vast expense of land, there's only about six to eight million people. I says, get them four, four at a time and multiply the ummah and Allah will bless you. You know, you'll be happy, you solve the Americans' problem and you solve your own problem. Increase the ummah. If you can't propagate, procreate. <laughs> now, I would like to see Brother Swagart write a book. Those brethren who are here from his group, I said, look, here is a problem, very serious problem. Your sisters and daughters, my sisters and daughters, they are all mine. I love them too. And I says, I feel for them. By God, I feel for them. They are literally going to the dogs. Literally going to the dogs. You read Dr. Kinsey's, The Life of the American Female. But we read here, in your country, The Life of the American Female by Dr. Kinsey. The life of the American female is the same as the British female, the French female, the German female. Same! They're literally going to the dogs. I said, no, Islam supplies the answer. You will not hearken to it. I said, then you simmer in your soup. You are in hell. You are in hell and you'll remain in hell with your drunkards, with your sodomites, with your surplus women. There is no way out for you but to accept Islam. Islam offers you a solution. Jesus Christ says, for he will guide you into all truth. All truth, all your problems, bring them. Islam has the answers to all your problems. You haven't got them, and you'll never have them. You prescribe a remedy for alcohol. 
Brother Swagat, he says, I never drank in my life. I believe him. He never touched beer. He never smoked. He never drank alcohol. I take off my hat to him. In this environment, I said, man, you are an angel. <laughs> no, no. Look, in this environment, you didn't touch cigarettes. You didn't touch beer. You didn't touch any type of alcohol. I said, you are an angel. But the solution to your problem, you haven't got it. You see, your preachers, your evangelists, your born-again Christians, he's telling you in his book, the preacher. He says, they, the preachers, you know, alcohol, at a meeting of the evangelists, the preachers, the hot gospelers, the Bible thumpers, they were asked, somebody suggested, look, you people, you know, those of you who are prepared to speak out against the drinking of alcohol, imbibing of alcohol, Please stand up. And nobody stood up. They all want to drink. You know why? And the reason, and Jimmy, Brother Jimmy says in his book, that they reason. Reasoning is, he said, oh Lord, Jesus Christ turned water into wine. If it was good enough for him and his disciples, it's good enough for us. Logic is very good. And they tell you that this WNE wine, Brother Jimmy believes it was pure grape juice. I says, brother, you are not reading properly. You see, at the end of the feast, towards the end, when wine had run out, Jesus was asked by his mother, he says, look, help these people. You know, solve the problem. She knew that he had certain mysterious powers. So he says, woman, he's telling his mother, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. I say, is this how you call your mother? Same word, woman, he used as the prostitute. He says, woman, where are thine accusers? For a prostitute, he uses the word woman. For his mother, he calls her woman, not mother. He never called her mother in his life. According to the scriptures, he never called her mother. Woman, woman. He says, woman, I don't believe it. But that's the scripture says. Woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. And when he's persuaded, he says, all right, fill up the vats with water. And he turned water into wine. Since then, wine has flowed like water in Christendom. That wine, the, the imbibers who had been drinking the whole night, they say, why have you kept the best wine for the last? Why? In other words, it must have been a very strong, potent drink. If you have been imbibing, any drunkard will tell you, if you're imbibing the whole night, your senses, they get dulled. You need a stronger and stronger drink, more and more alcohol to make you feel that you're drinking something. If that person, after drinking heavily for the whole night, you give him pure grape juice, is like mud water. So when the man says, why have you kept the best for the last, means it must have been something very strong and potent. It's the same W-I-N-E wine, reasons the preacher. In Greek, as W-I-N-E wine that Lot drank and cohibited with his daughters. Same W-I-N-E wine in Greek. What Lot drank, same W-I-N-E wine that Jesus turned water into wine. This is an excuse. The only religion which says don't touch it is Islam. You listen to this Allah's command, solution is there. You don't listen, you're clever. Your cleverness now is coming in. Your preachers, he says, about the preacher, Brother Jimmy Swaggart. He says he went to the bank. He must be going very often. But he goes to a certain bank, bank manager, and he says, you know who are the worst payers? Asking Jimmy. He says, no. He says, preachers, painters, and prostitutes. Three P's. P, P, P. The banker says. And Jimmy says, he said, I agree. I agree. He said, I don't know about painters and prostitutes, but I do, I do know about preachers. This is his testimony. I said, look, these are the born again. Those who have the spirit in them. They said, the spirit permeates in them. When you speak to them, he says, the Spirit is telling me this, and the Spirit is telling me. And his direct communication with God, God speaks to him, he says, son, son. The Lord, I believe, spoke to my heart and said, you tell this distinguished gentleman this. When you speak to them, he says, the Spirit is telling me this, and the Spirit is telling me. And his direct communication with God, God speaks to him, he says, son, son. Which he didn't speak to his own son, in, in inverted commas, Jesus Christ. He never addressed him as son. He speaks in the third person about his own son, in inverted commas, his own son. But when it comes to anybody, everybody, all of these people, they said, God speaks to them. You know, if I had the chance, I said, what language? What language was he talking to you?
English? What language? Hebrew? Greek? And you call your son? In this one instance, a son again and a son again. He said, look, in certain problems, he said, look, I cannot tell you. God told him, I cannot tell you. I said, why couldn't I? Why couldn't he tell you? Didn't you know the answer? Oh, you were not fit. Why can I, cannot he tell you? You ask me a question, either I'm ignorant, I don't know, or I said, no, I can't tell you. Not now. I'll tell you on the way out. There might, there might be a reason. He said, you tell Mr. Didat if it was God that spoke to me. But when it comes to anybody, everybody, all of these people, they said, God speaks to them. You know, if I had the chance, I'd say, what language? What language was he talking to you in? English? What language? Hebrew? Greek? And you call your son? In this one instance, a son again, and a son again. He said, look, in certain problems, he said, look, I cannot tell you. God told him, I cannot tell you. I said, why couldn't I? Why couldn't he tell you? Didn't you know the answer? Oh, you were not fit. Why can I, cannot he tell you? You ask me a question, either I'm ignorant, I don't know, or I said, no, I can't tell you. Not now. I'll tell you on the way out. There might, there might be a reason. But the relationship, born again. There are 75 million born again Christians in America, according to Billy Graham in his book, How to Be Born Again. 75 million means one third of America are angelic. They got the spirit of God in them, one third, besides the preachers, one third. And Jesus says, a little leaven, leaven at the whole. You need a little yeast to ferment the whole loaf. If you have one third yeast in your bread, one third, and if it doesn't ferment the loaf, I said, there's something wrong, wrong with your yeast. Yeast, this is what you're talking about. The Bible does speak about the holy prophet of Islam. I have written a book expounding the verse I started with. You get that book. The title of the book is What the Bible Says About Muhammad. Fully detailed. On this verse, I give 15 different reasons to prove that that prophecy, I'm quoting, in the Bible, from the Bible, does not refer to Jesus but to Muhammad. Now, what you have to do, you eat to yourself. Get the book, read it, memorize the verse. You don't do that. You are here for entertainment. I know. You like to be entertained. Everything is entertaining you. So you come along to see this new entertainer. No. <laughs> no. You owe it to yourself. In this environment, look, you can change the people. Wallah. And I tell you, it's the destiny of Islam to change this country. You have it. Allah has given it to us. He's telling us in the Quran, he's given you a deen. He said, Li yuzay hirahu ala deen kulli. Is to master, overcome, and supersede every other deen, every other way of life, whether it be Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, communism, every ism. Islam is destined to master them all. So, wala ukari hal kafirun. No mind how much the unbeliever might not like it. And he repeats the same formula in the Quran again. And he ends by saying, Wala ukari hal mushrikun. No mind how the mushrik might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. And he repeats the same formula. Again in the Quran, three times. He says, Huwa allazi arsala rasulahu bil huda. He it is who has sent his messenger with guidance. Wa deen al haq And with the religion of truth. Li yuz hirahu ala deen kulli. That it may prevail, overcome and supersede every other deen. Bulldoze them all. Wa kafa billahi shaheeda. And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact. That is going to make his deen to prevail. With you or without you. But we human rubbish. I say all of you, you and me. Allah is giving us that opportunity. To serve his deen. Do a prophet's God and earn a prophet's reward. Allah has given you the answers, solution to the problems. Help them, and by helping them, you help yourself. Change them, and you have changed the world. We have a tradition that towards the end of time, the sun will rise from the west. The sun will rise from the west. What, how do you understand it? The sun, we know, the sun does not rise in the east, and it doesn't set in the west. It's an illusion that's been created. We know that the earth is rotating on its axis and while it's rotating, it's giving the impression that the sun is rising and the sun is setting. The sun doesn't rise and the sun doesn't set. This is the illusion that's been created by the rotation of the earth on its axis. So if the sun is to rise from the west, the way we see it, then the earth must come to a standstill and go into reverse gear. That's the only way it can rise from the west. Standstill is moving at a thousand miles an hour, 
at the moment that you know and it's going to come to a standstill apply brakes and then turn the other way you won't be here to see the sights you won't see them wallah everything will be washed away into the oceans once allah applies the brakes shh, the oceans will flow over and there won't be anything the highest peak will be all washed away so where is the fun of the sun rising in the west i said no it's the sun of islam the knowledge of islam the knowledge of god will rise from the west and this nation is hungry they go for anything anything goes here they worship sun young moon they worship guru maharaj swami parbhupada they worship the, the maharishi they worship father divine they used to worship his dead now father divine they are they have the satan worshiping cult here anything everything the nation is hungry is frustrated he doesn't know what to do they see all the filth around them they don't know what to do anything that comes across they grab what's wrong with you i said there's something wrong with you you muslims two million here oh like emasculated people wallah no you get such inferiority complexes beyond imagination in this country here the most advanced country on earth civilized with all this technology you are like spineless people wallah spineless muslims more especially i'm talking about those who have come from the east whether you are an arab or a pakistani or a bangladeshi or indonesian all spineless people what you have done to me when i came here in 77 what you're doing to me now i can see spineless people emasculated people castrated people you got no spirit no whim no energy no militancy in you i come in 77 and a lecture tour and i phone from new york to a station further west Muslim habitation, population. I said, now I'm coming. He says, what will you lecture on? Subject. I says, what the Bible says about Muhammad. It's a very good starter. Very easy to get started about comparative religion, that book, that subject. He said, right. According to the appointed time and date, I arrive. What have you advertised? They give me a pamphlet. Not like this, but small leaflet, what do you call it? Flyer. It says there, a prophet in the Bible. Ahmad Didad will speak on a prophet in the Bible. I said, you understand English? You university students? You monkeys? A prophet? I said, what is a prophet? You know what a means? You don't know. It means any prophet. A means any. It's an indefinite article. It means any prophet in the Bible. There are some 75 mentioned here any one of those are you interested in any prophet in the bible is the christian interested in any prophet in the bible is the jew interested in any prophet in the bible no your inferiority complex i say what the bible you're too terrified to even write those words another group i said muhammad the greatest when i go there they advertise muhammad the great equating my prophet with alfred the great the guy who burned the cake or alexander the great the pagan What's wrong with you sick people? Emasculated. Said the whole lot of you. I can see. I don't know. But Allah, in His mercy, He says, He says, Do not despair. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah. I would not be Muslim like if I did despair. But I said, there's something wrong with you people. You better wake up. Wallah, it's an opportunity Allah is giving you in this, in this time and age. In this age of technology, Allah has sent you here for reasons best known to you why you are here. But what an opportunity. They are thinking it's making the Christians mouth water when they see you. Look, the, tonight the people giving you literature is making the mouth water. You expatriates, you come here. He says, man, this is good stuff, easy stuff, easy meat. You are easy meat. They don't have to go to Malaysia, Indonesia, Bangladesh to preach. They can preach from their home base. They can sleep with the wife and children and they can come and preach to you. Language, they don't have to learn your language, you have learned their language. Culturally, you are westernized. The same sofa and chairs. What he has, same dining room table and chairs, which he has, there. They're not sitting down on the mat on the ground with the smoke coming from the kitchen, smarting their eyes, no. From every point of view, they feel that you are God sent to them. I said, yes, you are God sent to do a job of work also. Change them! People who can worship anything, everything, why won't they will not accept Allah Bari Ta'ala? Why won't they? The reason is you don't open your mouth. You know why you don't open your mouth? You're too terrified. You're suffering from a host of inferiority complexes. Get them out of you. 
Open the Quran, read the Quran, and let Allah speak to you. Allah will do it for you. Allow his book to touch you, your heart. And inshallah, allow Allah to talk to you. And he's talking to you in the Quran. He's talking to you and me and to every passerby in the street. Let him talk to you. And you will not be able to sit on your backside doing nothing. Waiting for the other people to come and mess, make a mess of you. To use you as a punching bag. To use you as a doormat. To want to make mess in your head. Is that the role? Allah says no. Leaves a hirahu aladdin kulli. Wakafa billahi shahida. And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact. That is going to make his deen to prevail. It's a privilege Allah is giving you. Take it. Wa akhir dawana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you, Mr. Didat, for giving us this lecture. And the first question is, Western society often refers to the inferiority of Muslim women and their suppression. What is the true position of a Muslim woman according to Islam? The position of the Muslim woman is, in Islam, that men have their rights and women have their rights. And the Quran says, Ar-Rijalu Kawamun al Nisa. Says man is a degree above women because he is the breadwinner. See, if there's extra responsibility put upon an individual, naturally he has extra powers. In other words, in no society, Western society that I know, that if a man deserts his wife, he is apprehended and is made to pay maintenance. But if the case is in reverse, they don't catch the woman and make her to pay maintenance for the family. So this is natural because the man is the breadwinner, he is made responsible, so he is a degree above women. There is no such thing as absolute equality, men and women. But women actually rule the home. You know, like the Frenchman says that women can do anything because they govern those who govern everything. And it's a fact whether in a Western home or in an Oriental home, Muslim home. Is the woman, if she knows how, you know, Shakespeare says, she stoops to conquer. If she humbles herself, he says, dear, what do you say? And the husband will turn and say, look, man, whatever you say, you know, where you want to go, San Francisco or New York, whatever you say, he's prepared to give in. So in other words, now it's left to the woman what she is. She wants to compete with man. We see the competition going on and it's creating all the problems. You do the same thing, your problems will be the same. So in Islam, the position is that they both have their rights. Men have their rights and women have their rights, but they are not absolutely equal. In the sight of God, they are all equal. But in social, for social purposes, there is like, for example, you know, divorce. There is, for example, man can have four wives and a woman can't have four husbands. You want equality? That the woman also can have four husbands? Well, you try it and see what happens. Mr. Didat, you have talked a bit about blacks and the problem of racism. Would you please present the Islamic solution of this problem, the problem of racism? You see, the Allah Baritala tells in the Holy Quran, Ya Yohannas, O mankind. The whole of mankind is addressed, not only Muslims. Ya Yohannas, Inna khalaknakum min zakarim wa unsa. So most certainly, Allah has created you all from a male and a female. And it is he who has made you into nations and tribes. That you may recognize one another. Not that you may discriminate and exploit one another. Inna akramakum in the atkakum. So the most certainly, the noblest in the sight of God is he who is the best in conduct. This is the standard laid out by Allah Ta'ala of judging. Not race, language, color, or riches, but your behavior. And not only as a theory, see, Islam has certain practical ways of bringing this about. Everybody speaks about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. 
The Christian will tell you that, the Jew will tell you that, the Muslim tells you that, that there is but one Lord and we are all his creation, we are his creatures, yes. Fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. But how do you implement that brotherhood? No system. Islam has a system. Five times a day it brings people together. Rubbing shoulders. The black and the white, the rich and the poor, the African and the Indian, the Arab and the Malay, everybody rubbing shoulders, using the same taps, using the same towels, standing shoulder to shoulder, no gaps left between one individual and another in our form of prayer, salat, so that the devil might not get in between you and your brother. That devil is not the one we see in the art galleries, you know, with horns, sharp ears, tail with a barbed hook, ruddy complexion, no. It's not that devil. When our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa he said that we must not leave gaps between one devotee and another so that the devil might get in between you and your brother. The devil he was talking about was your race. I'm white, he's black. I'm rich, he's poor. That devil must not be allowed to take, to get in between you and him. Because if you did, you see, if I stand at a distance, you say, oh, this guy is a Negro, I'm an Indian. See, I'm an Arab, he's an Ajam. No. There's no opportunity, so stand shoulder to shoulder, no gaps left. In other words, a practical system. Then, if one can afford once in a lifetime, go on a pilgrimage. On a bigger scale in your social around, uh, environment, Fridays. The masjid, the cathedral mosque, the Juma masjid. And the higher this thing, Eidgah, on Eid occasions. Get out and get people from all over the place into one common place. And on a universal level, go on a pilgrimage. There you go and you get surprise of your life. He says, what, a man from Tamil Nadu? He's a Muslim? Because in my country, all the Tamils are Hindus. Hey, he's Tamil and he's a Muslim. This man here, pitch black, like coal from Ethiopia, Muslim, my brother. And this guy here with blonde hair and blue eyes, like a, a German or a Norwegian, Muslim from Turkey. No, it eliminates racism. It's a system, not only talking, but a system that keeps on bringing you about five times a day when you make salat and at you end the salat, it says, Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So peace and blessings of Allah to everybody to the right of me. And I see here, here is a man from Ethiopia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I see here is a man from Africa. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Next time I see a man from China. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I see a man from Timbuktu. So what it does is a system of eliminating racism. Talking is not alone. It is a system laid out by the Almighty, the all-wise, how to. And alhamdulillah, we Muslims, we are the least racist of any group of people on earth. We still have it, the lingerings from the past, like in my own case, you see, my ancestors were Hindus. In India, we had a caste system. We divided mankind into four different groups. In South Africa, they divide you into four different groups, racial groups. In my country, into castes, four different castes. I'm a Muslim, but the environment is telling me again and again that this guy is a Brahman, he's tough, and this is an untouchable, he's low down. 5,000 years of Hindu blood has been flowing in my veins. So, if there is still some, something lingering on, you can understand, people can understand. But, as a people as a whole, we are the least racist of any other community on earth. What does it? It is Islam. So Islam not only talks about it, but it shows you how to solve it. Yesterday you proved that the Bible was not the word of God. How could you now quote the Bible to predict the coming of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Please explain. Yesterday was a debate. A format had been laid out. Originally it was 50 minutes, 60 minutes and 10. Both sides had 60-60. But the format was, whoever speaks first has 10 minutes at the end. Because every advantage has a disadvantage. So both speakers speak 60 minutes each. Now, with that format, you have no time to explain each and every position. So what is the Bible? So what do we consider the Bible to be? As a whole, per se, we say, this is not the book of God. And I proved it. 
according to all reasoning, according to the book itself, the internal evidence that Moses didn't write the books attributed to him. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't write the books attributed to them. Not only is it not the book of God, but it's not even the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. You're talking about 24,000 manuscripts. I challenge you, says there's no two are identical. So you've got 24,000 different Gospels. Which one? You just pick to the pick that suited you, you accepted it. Who authorized you? Council of Nisi. They said, we take this, we take that, we take that. All the Gospels that are now accepted were not accepted at one time. It's now pick and choose what suits you, you accept it. That's what you have done. And you say, now it's the Word of God. But now the Word of God is in it, in the book. The word of God is in the book. The word of the prophet is in the book. The word of the historian is in the book. And pornography is in the book. Now, I have to explain all that to you. I said, you see, I give you examples about the word of God. Like in the book of Deuteronomy. You see the verse I quoted in Arabic? The same thing is in the Bible. Almost an identical idea is there. It reads, I will raise them up a prophet. I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren like unto thee. And I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So who is this I? God. He's speaking to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. That I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren. From among the Bani Ismail. Bani Israel are being addressed, is from among your brethren, like unto thee, like you, like Musa. And he will, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So he says, this I is God. You don't have to be a theologian, or a DD, or an evangelist. Anybody will tell you on the plain reading of it, that these are not the words of Moses, these are the words of God. Another quotation from the book of Isaiah, as if God is speaking, and God is speaking. He said, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Who's that? Isaiah? No. No Jew says that Isaiah claimed divinity. They would have killed him if he did. No, he's speaking on behalf of God. God is speaking through him like a mouthpiece. This is the job of a prophet of God. He is a mouthpiece of God. He hears the words of God and he conveys them to you. So, I, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is no savior besides me. Who? God. God is talking. This is the word of God. You don't have to be a professor of theology to see that. There is another type of evidence in the Bible. See, now, if it was a lecture, I would have been, done all this last night. But this is a debate. So whatever the man is throwing at you, you can't start grappling with everything. The caravan is moving and the dogs start barking. You don't start the caravan moving back to chase the dogs. You've got to move on. You've got to do your job and get, get on with it and finish your job. There was no occasion for explaining all these things to you. you see? Then there is the prophet, word of the prophet of God. Example, Jesus says, It has been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, had committed adultery with her already in his heart. Who is this? I, Jesus. Jesus is talking. The word of a prophet of God. Again, Jesus says, it has been said by them of old time, that whosoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. But I say unto you, who is this? I, Jesus. Words of a prophet of God. Again, Jesus says, it has been said by them of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, who is this I? Jesus. The words of a prophet of God. Then there is another type of evidence in the Bible. First was, as if God speaking. Second was, as if a prophet was speaking. Third, what does the historian, how does he speak? He says, in the Gospel of St. Mark, so while he, talking about Jesus, in bracket, I put Jesus. While he was going forth into the way, he, Jesus, saw a fig tree in the distance with leaves. Happily, he came up to it, wanting to find figs thereon. But when he, Jesus, came, there was nothing but leaves, for the season was not yet. Who's writing? An eyewitness or a your witness, not God and not Jesus. So you see, another type of evidence. Word of God, word of the prophet, 
go to the historian. And there was that other type of thing. I was suggesting, and I lost $100. You remember, if you were there, I lost $100. I wanted Brother Swaggart, you know, to read a certain chapter from the book, from the Bible. And he ignored it at first. Maybe he had no time. And somebody from the audience prodded him again. He says, you know, look, what about that chapter as a keel? And there was $100 also involved. So he read it. But he read it at 60, 60 miles an hour. <laughs> so one of your university students, while I'm sitting there, he comes to me. He said, look, he read, but uh, I didn't know. Uh, so what was the joke? I said, look, one thing is, you are at a disadvantage. You are an Arab from Arab country. You don't know English too well, number one. Number two, that the English that he was using were, was archaic, old-fashioned, from the King James Version. You see, we had given him that pamphlet, which was in, from the new international version, modern language, where you call a spade a spade. But he was reading from that archaic Bible. I can't blame him for that, because he uses that. King James, he read it. And you don't know English too well. That's also a disadvantage. And he was reading at that speed I told you just now. So these are all the facts. I said, look, what you do, you go and read it, you know, in that pamphlet and you see what he was reading. So he read it. You know, bulk of the people, I'm sure, they didn't catch the joke. You know, the speed, his pronunciation. He was not as emphatic when he quotes other biblical verses. You know, he makes every word and phrase to go down your throat or down your ears. But here was something different, 60 miles an hour. So, so <laughs> There is that type of thing, which I said, no decent man can read it to his mother, sister, daughter, or even his fiance if she's a good woman. Now, what you have to do is you have to go and read it yourself to know what was read. You didn't catch the joke. It's no fault of mine. You see, you don't understand English too well, and then, you know, the speed, and the archaic language, all these things were factors where you don't catch the joke. But if you catch the joke, then, you know, something that no decent man can read in his church or to his family, right? So this is it. There's another type of evidence. So we have the word of God in the Bible. There is the word of the prophet in the Bible. There's the word of the historian, an eyewitness or your witness in the Bible. And there is that other type which we say pornography in the Bible. Now, we also have such a thing in Islam. We have the word of God in the Quran. Only Allah's kalam. He doesn't tell you stories. We know an incident in the life of the Prophet wasallam that a Christian deputation had come from Najran in Medina. These were Arab Christians. They had heard that another Arab, he is claiming that he's in communication with the Almighty. He's a prophet. So he said, let's go and cross-examine him. Let us go and see what he knows. So they came to Medina, and they were housed in the Masjid al Nabawi. They ate there, they slept there, and they had a dialogue there for three days and perhaps three nights. And when Sunday came, our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam he offered the masjid to these Christians to offer their prayers. He was so broad-minded, not like us. See, some of us we are, you know, we think our masjids are superior to the Masjid al Nabawi that our Nabi had. No doubt in construction, yes. He allowed them gave them permission to make their prayers. So during the course of this discussion, the spokesman for the Christian poses the question, among so many other things. Say, all right, now tell us, O Muhammad, what is your concept of God? And our Nabi Kareem, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he doesn't fumble. You know, well, you see, it's like this and like that. No, he doesn't do that. He is the God of Abraham, Moses, and David, and Solomon, you know, who spoke to Abraham. No, he doesn't talk like that. See, when the question is posed, what is your concept of God? So the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as if he was pressing his spiritual buttons, trying to contact Filawhim Mahfuz, the head computer. So, oh my Lord, what shall I say? Nobody heard that. There were no buttons to press. I said, as if, I hope you people understand that. Then when I go away, don't create a controversy. He said, Muhammad pressed buttons. You know, he had a computer. I said, as if, oh my Lord, what shall I say? Comes the answer through him. Qul, say, Allahu ahad. He is Allah the one and only. Allahu samad, God the eternal absolute. 
Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not beget and is not begotten. Wa lam yakun lahu kufan ahad. And there's nothing like unto him. Full stop. And you see, this is our concept of God. Now you see, it's on a different level. He is made to say, Qul, say. He's asking, oh my Lord, what shall I say? Nobody heard him say that. But comes the answer, say. It doesn't fit into normal speech. They are asking, what is your concept of God? So you don't tell him, say. Somebody asks you, what is 12 times 12? What do you say? 144. Am I right? 6 times 6? 36. You don't say, say 36. Say 144. Do you say like that? No. Why say? Because the words are being put through his mouth. From Fi Lawham Mahfuz, from the preserved tablet, from the head computer. See, he's in contact, he's got that machine. Spiritual buttons. Ya Bari Ta'ala is communicating. What shall I say? He says, say, who Allah Ahad. Now, that I say. Look, all these things that I told you is not in the Quran. In the Quran, you open Surah Ikhlas, chapter 112, you start. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Qul hu Allahu Ahad, say is Allah the one and only. Allah Samad, God the eternal, absolute. Lam yalid wa lam yulad, he does not beget and is not begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufu wa ahad, and there's nothing like unto him. Full stop. That's all. Where he was, what was the occasion, what, how did it come about, nothing. So only the word of God. Everything else, where the details given to us later on. They said, look, this is what happened. People who were eyewitnesses, your witnesses, what's happening. What our Nabi said, what happened. All that put together is our knowledge. You find the other de details in the books of Hadith. Words of the Prophet, separate volume. Allah's Kalam, separate volume. Hadith, words of the Prophet, separate volume. History, Imam Ghazali, Ibn Rush, Ibn Taymiyyah. Great writers, great writers, separate books, separate books. And our Arabian Nights, also separate books. <laughs> yes? You know the Arabian Nights? You know, fairy tales, those filthy, dirty stories were circulating around the campfire. You know, the Arabs also had something to pass time with. You know, pre-Islam, before Islam, and even maybe after Islam. You know, under Harun al-Rashid, Mamun al-Rashid, we don't know how the empire developed. And they were wanting to pass time, you know, somehow, light-heartedness, <laughs> jokes, filthy, dirty stories. You stole around the campfire, right? They're written now in books. Fitzgerald, he translated it, the Arabian Nights, the unexpurgated edition. I read it and I enjoyed it very much. Was a young boy. Oh, I loved it, you know. <laughs> the unexpurgated editions. But it's separate. It's not in the Quran. It's not in the works of the sayings of the prophet. It's not in the works of a historian. Separate book. So we have the words of God, word of the prophet, word of the historian, and pornography all in separate compartments. They have it all in one volume. <laughs> so how can we use it, you say? I said, look, where in a case, any worldly dispute, if it goes to court, you see, the plaintiff, the man who makes the complaint, he goes into the box, you know, the witness box, and he testifies, he gives his testimony, he lays his charge. Then your lawyer, you are the defendant, your lawyer cross-examines him about the things about which he can prove to the judge, the guy is lying, he's lying, he's lying. Among his lies, he's also speaking certain truths. But now, in any civilized nation on earth, how do you deal with this problem? Where he was lying, you take that out. He said, look, you say that it was a dark night? He said, yes. The moon was not on, he says. There was no street lights, no. And he said, you saw his car? He said, yes. And you read the number plate? He said, yes. He said, have you got such sharp eyes? You know, microscopic or what eyes, you know, x-ray eyes that you can see all these things? He said, can you see something there? He said, no, I can't. He said, look, there's so much lighting here and you can't see that curtain there? What color? Something written there? He said, no, I can't. So what he's telling to the judge, the guy's lying. He's a liar, he's a liar, he's a liar. <laughs> Once you prove your case, he closes the case. And he asks for absolution with cost. Means the case must be thrown out and I'm going to get cost for all the trouble he has given me. And he'll get it. Now he said, look, but you know, what about that statement I said which was true? The, the court doesn't consider that. You see, you take what you can prove your case, and the rest is said, look, man, that is something that's got nothing to do with us. 
We prove to the world, we prove to you that you haven't got a leg to stand upon. This is my inheritance, this clause so and so refers to me. For this reason, that reason, that reason. Close the case, the job is done. This is how you reason anything in life. And we do the same when it comes to religion. I was a Christian before, but now I have converted to Islam, and I am at peace. I, I practice. I practice Islam very much and try my best to be a good Muslim. Before I converted to Islam, I was a gay. Now that I'm a Muslim, I still get feelings about other men. I try my best to avoid these feelings. How or what would you recommend me doing to totally void myself of homosexuality? Brother, I can't give you any easy solution. I can't give you a pill. I said, look, you take this pill and your problems will be over. You see, a lifetime of evil habit, it takes great effort, great sacrifice, you know, to control it, to curb it. And what you need is good company and the company of Allah's kalam. You read this book of God with understanding. If you read it with understanding, you will find that Allah Bari Ta'ala, God Almighty is talking to you. And when you allow him to talk to you and talk to you and talk to you, his words will do the job for you. There is no easy way. I can't say that there is some easy way that, as I said at the beginning, you take a pill or you take something, I give you a piece of paper with something written on it, put it on your neck and you will be, you know, solving this problem. I have no such easy solution. It's a battle and which you'll have to carry out to the best of your sincerity, energy, you carry it out, and I believe, and I believe that God Almighty will help you in your effort to go straight. I hope so, inshallah. How can you explain the fact that so many Christians believe in the Bible as it is these days, although you claim that it contradicts itself and it's so obvious? How can you explain the fact that so many Christians believe in the Bible as it is these days, although you claim that it contradicts itself and it's so obvious? You see, brainwashing. <laughs> Brain. We all get brainwashed. See, last time when I came in 77, I was speaking to uh, students and professors in the University of Berkeley, San Francisco. And I said, you are all brainwashed. So one professor stood up and corrected me. He says, no, programmed. I said, I beg your pardon, programmed. We are all getting programmed. You see, we are all programmed from childhood into certain beliefs, certain attitudes. And if nobody comes along, with a better understanding knowledge to reprogram you, to deprogram you, you remain there. Because he's like a drowning man. He's found something. You know, you say, look, this book can't help you. It is the spirit within you that has helped you. You have been an alcoholic all your life. And you were looking for a way out. You wanted somebody to help you. You know, you go home and you see your wife is terrified. You find the children are terrified. They're all getting out of your way. You know what's going on. You know, it's terrible. It's horrible. But what can you do? What can you do? You don't like it. But you are helpless. You are in the clutches of this devil, alcohol. And there comes along a person with a little charisma. And, you know, he says, look, man, think and believe that Christ is there for you. He's done everything for you. He's paid for you. Emotionally, you are in a mood for change. You are like a drowning man, struggling to get out, to save yourself from drowning. And the straw, you know, that you hit upon the straw and you were able to come out. You say, the straw helped me. I says, no, it was the struggle that you have been going on in your heart and mind. The struggle you put up brought you to the shore, not the straw. But now when you are trying to explain that on a logical basis, it's a look, it's, the, it's your struggle that saved you. Your intention, your sincerity that saved you. So, no, he's thinking that now you're trying to push him back into the mire. No, we are only explaining. But now 
people have gone through this experience and they're terrified. If they let go of this, Christ, Christ died for my sins, he saved me. He says, brother, it is your determination, your will, your faith that saved you. He says, no, 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 Christ saved me. As if he's trying to, he's terrified. He says, you want to drown him again, you want to push him back into it, which is not the case. So you see now, we have to give the people an alternative. They haven't got it. The only book they know is this. And this book they can see, the bulk of the people, they can see, man, what mess it has made. It hasn't got answers to the problems. So when he lets go, he lets go or he can, grabs, grabs anything. Hare Krishna movement. You know, the guys with a little pigtail, they go around dancing with the yellow saffron clothes and with the drumming. No, look, it is the mind. You know, you want something, grab something. I say, I get peace here. I get peace there. So you join the Munis, you find peace. You join Hare Krishna movement, you get peace. It's any movement. It, it is what you were yearning for, that you were striving for, and these are just excuses. The straws, the straws, the straws. It's not the straws that are saving you. So our Christian brothers and sisters, they don't know anything about the Quran. They know nothing about the Quran. If their own book lets them down, what about any Eastern book? The Quran, an Eastern book, what can it do for you? They don't know this book. And the trouble is with us. We haven't done anything to educate them. We ourselves, we don't know anything about the Quran. The bulk of us. How do you speak to a Christian? My Arab brothers, you see, look, no knowledge. You are good Muslims at heart. Maybe you are good Muslims. You know the Quran. But how are you going to explain to them what the Quran says? In your heart and mind, you understand when you say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Inna Allah astafaki wa taharaki wa astafaki ala nisa ala alameen. Beautiful. Translate it. Translate it for your hearer. How are you going to translate it? So, well, you see, uh, the angel came and uh, he took. Look, what else can you do? You know yourself, you understood it beautifully. MashaAllah. You know what it says. But now, you don't know the language, you don't know the right terminology. See, you are just a new person here. You know, you are maybe a mathematician and electronics and all that. But this language, how to translate what you are reading, you don't know. So my brother said about you people, he said, look, those Qurans are for the non-Muslim, American. He didn't use the word non-Muslim, but that's what he meant. American, you are, most of you might be born here. You're also American. Muslim, born here, you're American. But he said, no, no. He had in mind non-Muslim American. So he let them have it. But that's also not good enough. You see? You, I said, you Arab also need it. Believe me, you need this translation. In this environment at home, you don't need it. Allah, in the sight of Allah, you don't need it. Translations you don't need. But now to talk to this in this ocean of westernization, Christendom, English environment, you need a translation to put the correct words, correct meanings of what you're reading. It's there in the mind, but you can't reproduce it. So now you get the translation, Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 42. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, like this one here. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu. So behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah astafaki wa taharaki wa astafaki ala nisail alameen. That God Almighty has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Ya Maryamu. So, O Mary, worship thy Lord devoutly, prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. Now, if you can memorize that English, you know Arabic already. I have experimented on groups of Arab students in the, in the at Dahran University. You see, I said, now how many of you know? How many of you? And all of you have written it down. How many of you? And almost 80% put up their hands. I said, are you all half as Quran? He says, no. He says, how do you know? Well, constant reading. Your language, easy to retain. Right. I says, mashallah. You have done the job. You know it. Now I said, now, how to improve English? I'm going to teach you how to improve your English. You see, I learn many languages. I know many languages. Samples. I can quote you Indonesian, Swahili, Spanish. What language? Nigerian, Zulu, Tuana, African, Zulu, uh, Arabic, Hebrew. What language do you want to hear? Tell me, tell me quickly. 
Of this I have name. What language you want to hear? Huh? German. I didn't say German. Come on, come on. Any. <laughs> the languages I said, Swahili, Indonesian, or Malaysian, you know, Spanish. Spanish. Huh? Swahili. Se tazameni mikono yangu na migu yangu. Ya guwa ni mimi umenyewe. Umshige ni mshige ni uone. Waguwa roho haina mbili na mifuka. No, I learn languages. Different, different languages. It serves my purpose, you see. This way, you see, Hebrew, I wanted to go to Israel to talk to my cousins, delivering the message from the last will and testament of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. So I says, I go to them, talk to them. I says, you see, in the last will and testament of Musa alayhi salam, book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18, it says, Navi akim lahim mikarib akhayhim kamukhawi natati before we the bir. I want to speak to my Arab brothers. I don't know Arabic. So I learned, I get the Arabic Bible. So I meet Christian Arabs. I says, you know Arabic? He said, yes. I had an argument with a fellow who was giving me a lot of trouble in Canada at a place called Hamilton. You see, a lecture, at the end of the lecture, this man here is asking me questions and he won't let go. Another question and another question. Fortunately, you haven't got the chance tonight, you see. This is all written on paper, so you've got no chance of coming back in a hurry. But that man there, verbal question, one question, I answer that, another one and another one. Eventually, when the meeting is over, he's still around me, he won't let me go. From his tongue, I can make out he's an Arab. And from his, what he's asking, I know he's a Christian. So I said, you Arab? He said, yes. He said, I'm a Christian from the Lebanon. I said, you know Arabic? He said, yes. Of course, he says, that's my mother tongue. I said, go, go, you don't know Arabic. This is intellectual judo. You know judo? <laughs> intellectual. You said, no, I mustn't do it like that. So I said, look, you, you are 1,000 million. You're doing your own way. Go ahead. I'm not interfering with you. This is my way, you see? When I was young, I did judo. I did boxing. I did wrestling. I did weightlifting. Therefore, you see, I'm 69. I'm still standing straight. <laughs> So I said, go, go, man. You don't know Arabic. He said, you mean to say you know my language better than me? I says, no, no. I'm ashamed to tell you that I'm a born Muslim, but I don't know Arabic. It's the language of the Quran. It's the language, language of Jannah, language of my prophet. But I don't know Arabic. I'm ashamed of myself. Then so what do you mean I don't know Arabic? I said, you see, you read this book, the Bible, in your own mother tongue, in Arabic. I said, yes. And I said, you are understanding the exact opposite of what you're reading. Not what is there. If you are told in the Bible, thou shalt not commit adultery. You are understanding as if it is saying, thou shalt commit adultery. So, what do you mean? You take me for a zombie? I said, no, 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 no. I said, look, I will prove it to you. I will prove it to you. So I said, do you remember when Jesus went to that upper room where they had the Last Supper after his alleged crucifixion? I said, he goes in and he wishes his disciples, Shalom Aleichum, peace be unto you in Hebrew, same as Salam Aleichum. When he said, peace be unto you, I said, his disciples were terrified. So why were they terrified? When you meet your long lost master, your uncle, your grandfather, you're happy. The Arab, as he embraces one another, kisses one another. I used to feel very funny before, but I'm used to it now. <laughs> Some people in the middle of the kiss on my forehead. You know, I feel so funny, you know. <laughs> but now I'm getting used to it. However, the Arab and the Jew embraces one another. See, his master embraced. Instead of doing that, the guys are terrified. I said, why were they terrified? He says, no, Luke tells us, chapter 24, verse 36, that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. I said, did it look like a spirit? He says, no. Then I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like one? He's puzzled. So I said, look, the reason is I gave all that. Then I said, you know, Jesus wants to assure them that they're not what they're thinking. They're thinking he's come from the, back from the dead. He's resurrected. So he says, Unzuru ila yadaya wa rijalaya. He says, behold my hands and my feet. Inni ana huwa, that it is I myself. So husuni wan zuru. He says, handle me and see. Fa inna ruha laysa lahu lahman wa izamun. For the spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. And they felt him, and they believed not for joy, means they were overjoyed and wondered. What happened, man? We thought the man was dead and buried. 
So he says, Aindakum hahuna ta'am, if you get any here anything to eat, Fana waluhu juz min samakin, wa shay'an min shahadi asalin, fa akhaza wa akala kudamahum. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and a honeycomb, and he took it, and he ate in the very side, as to prove what? That is the ghost, he's a spook, he's a spirit. No, to prove I'm the same fellow man, damn fools, what are you afraid of me for? Shh, I bowled him over, this Arab Christian, that language. So I do learn these snippets are from different languages. I don't know Hebrew, I don't know Indonesian, I don't know, you know, Arabic, but I don't know Spanish, but I can give it to you. So how do I do it? I say I have a unique way of learning. Unique method, unique. Nobody, I'm a unique person, you know that. There's not another person on earth. No, this is, everybody's unique. Wallah, everybody's unique. Everybody's unique. See, I'm not boasting, but everybody's unique. I told my wife one day, that I'm unique. She doesn't believe it. <laughs> but I proved it to her. She didn't believe it. She thinks I'm boasting. Nobody like me. I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm unique. There is really nobody like me. She says, no. So I said, you know, in the family, Mr. So-and-so, I don't want to take the name. So she sees, mentally, she sees the father. I said, is there another guy like him? So she sees, she says, no. I said, our son, elder son, my elder son, Ibrahim. I said, is there another guy like him? So she scans, she says, no. I said, your brother, Ibrahim, her brother. I said, is there another guy like him? So she scans, she says, no. I said, you see, I tell you, everybody is unique. <laughs> but I have a unique method, it is unique. I said, you see, I use the Bible to learn these languages. Any language I want to learn, I go and get a Bible in that language because they got it in 2,000 different languages. And I know the Bible in English extensively by heart. People think I'm half the Bible, which is not the case. Half the Quran is not the case. But it seems at times, half the Quran, half the Bible, I'm not. But I know this book extensively. I haven't come across a single Christian in my life who knows his Bible better than I know. Alhamdulillah. So because I know this so much by heart, if I want to learn Arabic, I get the Arabic Bible. And I open the verse which I already know. Very easy to learn and understand every word. I went to Indonesian, I went and got an Indonesian Bible. So already what I know, I look for it in Indonesian. I went to Zulu, I do the same. Swahili, I did the same. That's how I learned. It's a unique method. And I want you to do the same. Ah. In other words, I'm going to tell you all to go and buy Bibles and go and learn like that. I says no. But what I have in English, the Bible, you have in Arabic, the Quran. I said, use that. You know this? Verses? I said, yes. Now you get an English translation. Look at the verse that you already know. See, behold, the angel said, O Mary, memorize that. Behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah astafaki wa taharaki wa astafaki ala nisa ala alameen. So I said, learn that English. Verse by verse. You know Arabic, now learn English. Now, once you have done that, your vocabulary is improving. Construction of sentences is improving. Now an opportunity for use. I said, here around Dahran, I to, I'm told that there were some 10,000 Americans. I said, they're all your customers. Any white man you see, you ask him, excuse me, sir, what church you belong to? He gives you a name. You know he's your customer. He says, you know, we believe in Jesus. I said, yes. He's thinking maybe you want some cigarettes or chocolate from him. He says, you know what my book says about Jesus? He says, no. It says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu. He said, behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah has tafaki wa taharaki wa tafaki. I said, look, do that. Practice. Talk, talk, talk. And as soon as you go to Britain or America for studies, you will be on a better wicket. You see? The biggest problem you students have, I know, at that conference I was told that number one problem when you come to this country, though you have learned English at home, your language, your problem is language, number one. Second year, problem number one, language. Third year, problem number one, language. Fourth year, maybe language takes second place or third place. Some other problems. Language, language, language. That's your problem. So I said, no.
This is how you master. You do Allah's work. You talk. You read Arabic. Allah gives you sawab, sawab, sawab. Every letter that you read, He gives ten, ten sawabs, blessings. When you say Alif, Lam, Mim, ten, 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 thirty sawab. You say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. It's a 190 sawabs. So what is Qalatil Malaika to Ya Maryamu? I didn't count them, but over 200 sawabs. Blessings, blessings. You're getting sawab. Arabic is becoming more fluent. Your English is improving. You're getting the courage now. Every time you meet a man, you can talk. You become a talker. You know, if we gave you the opportunity tomorrow morning to ask questions from the floor, not even a quarter of this will be here. You know that? Terrified. Terrified. I've seen it again and again. As soon as they come and write, flood. A flood of questions. Why? You are terrified to stand up and speak. Why? Because you're not used to. This is it. Stand up and speak, man. Ask. Make a fool of yourself. But as you keep on making a fool of yourself, you'll improve. Catch your customers. Here. Yeah. Man, what an opportunity. 200 million Americans. Everybody is prepared to listen to you in the language which you are now trying to acquire. Talk to him and bowl him over. Talk to him, improve your English. Talk to him and get spiritual blessings that Allah may reward you here as well as in the hereafter.